Hi, everybody. So as a quick intro for the, those of you that may not be familiar, so Apache Beam is an open source API for expressing data processing pipelines, and in particular, data parallel batch and stream algorithms using one single unified API. <clears throat> the, the design that went into this was primarily focused on cleanly separating data processing logic from runtime requirements. Whereas in most systems uh, and most APIs before Beam, typically the APIs intertwined with the execution logic, with, with the engine, with the parameters you need to uh, pick and, uh, and set for the program to run uh, well on other engines. So in particular, if, if you compare it to other APIs, other APIs typically control sharding, how many machines, what degree of parallelism, and things like that. There is no such things in Beam. Beam is designed to be higher level and to express and focus specifically on your uh, data processing logic and leaving all runtime requirements to the engine itself. So the smart engine can take advantage of the APIs exposed by Beam to automatically tune number of machines, sharding, and all other things that the engines and smart engines could do. And this separation of runtime requirements from the data processing logic enables a single beam pipeline to run on multiple engines. That's one of the key value propositions of the project itself. So if I were to summarize Beam, I often use this sentence. This is, this is the vision that we set up when we started building it. as a unified programming model designed to provide efficient and portable data processing pipelines. Those are these three key things, unified, efficient, and portable. What unified means is no matter what you are expressing, no matter how you are running, whether you use batch or streaming, bounded or unbounded p-collections, or any kind of data, parallel data processing logic, you should be able to solve it with one single unified API. And then, after we came up with this, this word of the unified API has been replicated in a number of projects afterwards. Then the second thing is this efficiency concept. Right? So if you're building a big, big data system, if you're running on a cluster of machines, we are taking advantage of this uh, horizontal scaling of that factor, you know, if we have 10 machines, that things theoretically could be 10 times faster. So really, because this is not kind of an exponential function, it's just horizontal scaling, we really have to take care of performance and efficiency. And APIs in Apache Beam enable the, the most efficient use of resources of any system out there. And then finally, the concept of portability, right? Write once, run anywhere. So this is not the only talk uh, at this conference about Apache Beam. So yesterday I was holding a Birds of a Feather session on IoT streaming and data flow uh, with myself and several other authors of, of other similar systems. And it was a great session if, if uh, some of you were able to, uh, to join us last night. For others, this will be available as a, as a recording. And then just after this session, we'll hear from Anton about streaming SQL and very specific uh, ways that Beam is approaching SQL uh, in a session just following this one in another room somewhere close by. So going back, kind of a little bit of history, kind of uh, how far we've gone. So not so long ago, just two and a half years ago, Apache Beam project was started. Uh, basically, back in early 2016, when the project was donated uh, by Google and several other companies to join uh, in the Apache incubation process. And 2016 was the year of incubation, where really the project was prepared, was changed to be really and truly open source, really equal to all runners, and really be vendor neutral. That culminated uh, about one year ago when uh, the project graduated as a top level project the Apache Software Foundation, and then several months later followed by the first table release. Right, we just recently celebrated the first year anniversary of that big, big release. And then in 2017 and 2018 is the time where the project is seeing enterprise growth, uh, adoption, particularly within Google Cloud, but also uh, uh, outside Google Cloud as well. The latest formal release is 2.4.0 that was released in late March uh, with the 2.5.0 kind of days away. 
So I'll, I'll spend just a few minutes uh, recapping the basic ideas of the B model, kind of the concepts that drove its evolution to explain kind of how streaming systems differ from batch systems and what is really necessary to provide a unified batch and streaming experience. Uh, so I'll try to go this uh, very quickly because kind of this is relatively repeated content from, uh, from previous talks, but for anybody that is new, uh, perhaps it, it, it's valuable, but I'll try to be quite fast. So if you are thinking about building a real-time system, obviously the concept of time is quite important. And there we d separate two things. One is event time and the other one is processing time. Obviously, right, uh, it's quite simple. Event time is the time the event actually happened, when the user did something that generated the event. And processing time is the time the system had a chance to process that event, um, often very closely to event time, but sometimes it may be uh, reasonably delayed. This uh, diagonal line shows uh, event time being equal to processing time. In the ideal world, uh, all events would lie on this diagonal line, but in, in reality, some events are delayed more than others. For example, this event number three is delayed just a little bit, and this event number nine was delayed quite a bit. Right? So if you're building an API, API is really uh, designed to answer the questions. Right? When you call the API, you provide some arguments. You're answering the questions the, the, the API is asking you. And in Beam, we focus on fo answering four different questions. And hypothesis is if you answer these four questions, you, are, you answered what is being computed, where in event time results are calculated, when in processing times are results materialized, and how do refinements of results relate. So answering these four questions enables the engine to run this, uh, this computation logic on a cluster of machines and process huge amounts of data and do it regardless of the source, regardless of batch or streaming and so on. So I'm going to focus on next four slides on these four questions. So first uh, question is obviously what is being computed and this is really the core of your business logic. And in this specific case, once again, we'll focus on uh, summing integers per key, right? So we are, we'll be building a pipeline that just simply sums integers. Think of it as we have a game, uh, players are playing a game, achieving some scores, and we are calculating some scores over, over a period of time. So we are summing integers, right? And obviously that can be expressed in Beam and many other systems with a one line of code, right? We take the input collection, we are applying a transformation on it, in this case some, summing integers per key, and getting a resulting uh, collection out, right? This is a, a virtual collection uh, spread over a, a large number of machines, and that can be very simply expressed in, this, in Beam and other systems with a one line of code. So if we were to do a simulation how this line of code would execute, this is the simulation, right? As the processing time goes on, we encounter elements, the system learns about the elements, it accumulates a sum, and once all of the things are done, it outputs the result, it's 51 in this case. Very simple standard batch processing over a large amount of data. So now we'll start building towards a streaming system. And the first step towards building a streaming system is answering the second question of the B model. It's where in event time, right? So if we're going to build a real-time system, we can't sum up forever. We have to be producing results over some period of time. So we have to divide the event time into windows. And we will be producing results on a given window. So we answer the second question of the B model with a second line of code by specifying that uh, the input collection is divided into fixed windows of, for example, of duration of two minutes. Right? And we can simulate this again uh, in a very uh, easy simulation. So instead of getting one result of 51, we get four results, 14, 22, 3, and 12, for these two minute chunks of event time. Right? Obviously, we are building towards a real-time system that is going to be producing results as we move along. But this is still a batch system. The reason why this is a batch system is because all of these four results are produced at the end of the entire processing. And to start uh, producing results as we move along, we have to answer the third question of the B model. It is when to produce those results. And we, again, make one line code change to answer that question and to st 
tell the system, to instruct the system to start producing results when the system believes it has seen all the results for that window. So let's see what happens. Right, so we have new squiggly line on this graph. We call this line watermark. And you see that it, what, when the watermark passes the end of the window, right? So here is the end of this window. The watermark passes the end of the window. We see the results for five, and then 22, and then three, and then 12, right? So when the watermark passes the end of the window, when the system believes it has seen all the results for a given window, it outputs the results. So at this point, we have a real-time system. We have a streaming system. Data is coming in, we have a heuristic that estimates based on what his system has seen, what has been seen so far. When everything is, ex what is expected is seen, we produce the result. This is a real-time system. And in this case, we made one mistake. So our heuristic was not great. We made a mistake with this element number nine that was delayed more than expected, more than average. And heuristic was wrong. So we have to deal with this if we are going to build a correct system. And that is generally achieved by answering the fourth question of the B model, which is how do refinements relate? So I'm going to make another one line change uh, approximately uh, to, this, uh, to this section of code. And we are going to instruct the system to, to uh, output a correction, a modification of a result for each late element it sees. This is with late firings at count one, right? For every late element we see, we output a correction. But to make things a little bit more interesting, we also want results early, right? When we, we wanna see kind of where the result is tracking towards, so we can also, uh, for fun, uh, specify a couple of additional firings, a couple of additional results per window. For example, early, even before we expect we have seen all the results, for example, every one minute we want an update. And then this red thing just specifies how do those refinements relate to each other, whether we get the entire accumulation or we just difference from the last one and things like that. So this is the final animation where we see kind of this first window, how we, get, we solve the correctness problem and after we see the element number nine, we, at, we output a correction 14 for the first window. And then in the second window, we see kind of two early results in addition to on-time result of 22. So at this point, we have built a really powerful system, a system that is real-time, a system that can deal with late data, and a system that can output incomplete speculative results. And we have achieved that with one, two, three, four, five lines of code. That's it. In addition, what's really powerful here is this would stand regardless of how complicated your processing logic is. In this case, you are summing integers, so the processing business logic was also one line. But the whole thing could have been really complex machine learning or basically any kind of computation, any kind of business process, still running it in batch or in very complex streaming would be still one, two, three, four, five lines of code. That's the power of the unified model in Apache Beam. All right, so that was kind of a, a quick intro of how we build streaming systems, how we build real-time systems, and now we are going to go kind of what the project is doing right now, how thing, where do things stand, what the project is, is doing going forward, and things like that. So I'll talk a little bit about Beam's vision for portability. Right, so at the core of the project is the Beam model. It's the abstractions that express the data processing logic. It's kind of that directed acyclic graph that you may have seen in similar systems that express in a system in the language agnostic and engine agnostic way the computation. That model is expressed in multiple SDKs and then it is executed on multiple runners. So we give users the choice of SDKs and the choice of runners. So kind of think of it, uh, the Beam project being the glue that connects the SDK, the APIs, to the engine itself. Obviously, visions are a journey. Uh, so the vision that I showed you before is not quite there. So we have multiple SDKs, Java, Python, and Go. We have multiple runners, like Apache Flink, like Apache Spark, 
like Google Cloud Airflow and some others. Java SDK, since the day one, runs on all runners. But other SDKs, Python and Go, do not. This is something that is in progress. And in particular, we call this within the Beam project the portability effort. So very recently, a portable Flink runner is basically complete. It's going to be released very shortly. And at that point, Flink runner will be able to run also Python and Go as uh, pipelines in addition to Java pipelines. And the Spark runner is coming uh, shortly uh, thereafter. Currently, I would call it in the design process. So while I have been on this very stage one year ago, and possibly even earlier to show a very similar slide here, now we are actually quite close to realizing this vision of portability. So it took a little bit longer than, than I had anticipated one year ago here and two years ago here, but now it's, it's actually it's within reach. Talking a little bit about example beam runners, uh, obviously Apache Spark is very well known to everybody in this audience. You have seen it probably mentioned in every other talk here at the conference, right? It's an uh, and it's really popular choice these days for executing data processing pipelines. And if you use Beam, you can absolutely use the Spark Runner. Similarly, Flink is a uh, more up and coming engine. It particularly shines on the streaming side of things uh, and has seen a wider adoption within the last one and two years. Uh, it's re it really shines for high throughput and low latency processing and it's choice of many Beam users. On the other hand, in addition to open source runners, we have some commercial uh, proprietary runners like Google Cloud Airflow. Uh, which is uh, uh, a quite nice system for Google Cloud users, but it's not available outside, outside Google Cloud. As a Beam user, you always have a choice of runners. You can choose to run on-premise on one of the open source runners. You can choose to run in, in any cloud on any open source runners. And specifically, if you choose Google Cloud, you could also choose Google Cloud Airflow. So I'm often asked kind of, to relate Apache Beam to other historical trends, kind of how we were thinking when we were approaching the project. And I usually like to think about Java as a great example of, of what Beam is trying to achieve, right? So before Beam existed, there were Spark was there and Flink was there. Before Java existed, there was C, C++, and many other programming languages. But in those languages, once you compile your program, it would run on a given operating system. It would run on the operating system you compiled it for, and you could not take that, uh, that program and run it anywhere else. Then Java came along, raised the level of abstraction, introduced bytecode, and enabled one simple Java program to run on your phone, on the tablet, in the data center, on a cluster, basically anywhere. Right? So this concept of write once, run anywhere, has been there in, in the uh, programming languages community for quite a long time. So Beam is trying to do the same thing, just not for general purpose uh, programming, just for the, for the niche of, of big data analytics, big data processing, things like that. Obviously, Microsoft.NET Framework is another uh, example of, of, the, of the same concept. Second most common question I get about Apache Beam is whether Apache Beam is the minimal common denominator over all of these things. Right, so really, how are you building an abstraction layer over multiple engines? Right, so one example would be to build a minimum common denominator, to really be in the intersection of the runner capability. So this would not be great. Obviously, you know, uh, it would be just too small, of an, uh, too small of a functionality set to be interesting. On the other hand, you can think of it as we could try to build a union, so whoever adds a feature, we add it to Beam and then everything can run anywhere or something. This would also not be particularly great because it would be more of a kitchen sink of everything. And we chose neither of these approaches and really thought about Beam being separate from engines, separate from runners. Really, Beam be serving the purpose of extracting useful patterns out of the underlying engines and exposing them at a high level and at the same time pushing primitives down into engines and kind of creating this uh, circle of influence where we extract useful patterns out and push useful primitives down. 
and create this nice separation of API or the language from the execution layer, right? Just like um, in operating systems, you have many layers, uh, you know, application layers, programming languages, and things like that. So the same concepts can be applied here. Separate execution logic from business logic of your pipeline. Now, if you're not building uh, an intersection of all runners, does it really mean that you can run every pipeline everywhere? Well, no, right? Because if uh, an engine can't run streaming pipelines, there is nothing you can do about it to make run streaming pipelines. So it's, it's, re it's not really true to say that every pipeline runs everywhere, right? Because engines are just different in what they can actually do. So to be very clear and, and honest about it, we have this concept of capability matrix, where we try to enumerate various features of the model and cover whether, and be very explicit whether they work on a particular engine or not, right? This was taken probably a year, year and a half ago, this screenshot, so uh, this specific uh, table may be out of date, but really this is, the, this is the place to refer to whether a particular pipeline can run on a particular engine. In practice, every pipeline can run on multiple engines, but not every pipeline can run on every engine. So to get started, uh, we have invested a lot of time a couple of years ago in building documentation, quick starts, walkthroughs, kind of in, in learning the programming model. Right? It's really about here we are trying to teach a way of thinking. We're trying to teach a programming model for, for people to uh, to really understand what's going on in their big data system. So kind of, uh, this resulted in several walkthroughs that kind of walk you through building one pipeline at a time, adding one line, how would this translate into an engine and things like that. It's are really useful for, for learning Beam, but lear learning distributed systems in general. So kind of, I, I'd, I'd uh, recommend kind of, regardless whether you choose to use Beam or not, kind of to refer to these materials that, that uh, a couple of us have been building for, for quite a long time. All right, moving forward from, from portability into the concept of extensibility. All right, so I mentioned already that Beam uh, wanted to, to connect different projects, really connect data pro expression of data processing logic with, uh, with engines. And we call that part extensibility. So I only talked so far in portability on the extensibility of SDKs and runners. We can have multiple SDKs that run on multiple runners. Uh, but we have four more extensibility points where we try to connect and be the glue in the, uh, in the, in the ecosystem, right? Obviously, I talked about SDKs. I'll skip it at this time. I talked about runners, I'll skip it at this time. But there is a concept of building SD DSLs on top of SDKs. So Beam really supports the concept of adapting the SDK to the given target audience. Maybe writing a data processing pipelines in, in Java is not for every community. Maybe some community of data scientists or some other community uh, would prefer a different kind of experience. Perhaps, a visual pipeline build, builder in a UI, or maybe JSON pipeline builder of some sort. And, and the concept of DSLs has been quite adopted within the Apache Beam project. And we have Scala DSL built on top of Java SDK. We have SQL uh, DSL built also on top of Java uh, SDK. And we have some commercial software commercial pipeline builders also built, like for example, talent data streams. Another concept is libraries of transformation where TensorFlow and Beam integrations come to play. And from the Beam pipeline, you can orchestrate various machine learning, uh, machine learning tasks, particularly with TensorFlow. And this works particularly well with uh, Beam's Python SDK. And then we have a large set of I.O. connectors and the ability to connect and extend a project to many, many sources and sinks. Whereas in other systems, uh, sources and sinks have been tightly coupled with the engine itself. Apache Beam is actually the first project that has really extensible and really portable I.O. framework. 
for, from my perspective, this is one of the most valuable parts, parts of the project. And I'm, obviously, we have a large set of connectors, but I won't go that at this time. Also file systems, but I'm going to uh, skip that uh, at this time. So if we really talk about what Beam wants to do, it's about, it's to provide ecosystem integration. So for those of you that might be Apache contributors or committers uh, in the audience, so I, I want to kind of uh, try to change the way people think, right? Historically, people would have an idea to build a system and then would build it from top to bottom. So I'm trying to make a claim like, if I want to build an engine, or I have an engine, or I, I know how to execute pipelines better, you write it as a Beam runner. If you do so, you automatically get great APIs for Java, for Python, for Go, multiple DSLs, right? You don't need to build the entire system. The scope of the project shouldn't be the, from the bottom of the stack to the top of the stack, right? By connecting with Beam, but on, on the runner side or on the SDK side, you can connect to the wide variety of groups that either have pipelines or have engines or have services that run them. So really, Beam provides that integration that, that is really necessary to, to kind of spur really fast uh, development cycle without requiring you to build the whole stack. So if you have an engine, write a Beam runner. If you want to extend the Beam to new languages, write an SDK. If you want to adapt to SDK to a target audience, write a DSL. In all of these cases, you'll get access to the other side of the matrix. The, this mix and match will work for you to get access to, to the group of people you may care about. Right? So Apache Beam desires to serve as a glue that integrates the big data ecosystem. And then in the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about what's going on in the project right now where the project is going, and what you can expect next uh, to be launched over the next several months and uh, early next year. So obviously the first thing is completion of the Beam vision, right? Run anything on anywhere, and this is really, really close. Another cool improvement, I'll, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit techy, in a techy way. Uh, this, uh, this upper um, snippet of code is the old do fun API, and we have a new do fun API that makes it much easier to, uh, to use and to access various elements. Whereas before you would have to read lots of stuff from cont process context and it was quite clunky to extract some parts of the data from process context, now you can do it much easier by having this dynamic way of specifying what the arguments are. So basically you can take out elements from process context and just declare them right here. Uh, with, with these uh, cool annotations. So there is no one signature of, of process element that you, that you are implementing. You can basically craft the, pro, uh, the, the function uh, definition as you like, depending on what you use in a, uh, in a given do fun. And this is quite cool and, for example, a, a, a part of the syntax that no other system has today. Another cool thing that's going on right now is schemas, right? So as of right now, Beam treats elements as opaque blog, uh, blobs. So we understand that, that you have peak collections. We understand that the, those peak collections have types. But once the, uh, the element comes to us, it's really an opaque blob. And we use the concept of a coder to, to deal with uh, serialization and deserialization. But we never look inside that element. Schemas change that. Obviously, this is not a new concept. Uh, it exists in, uh, in Spark, for example, uh, for quite a long time in the form of data frames. So this is something that, that where Beam, for example, is catching up. And you know, it, uh, that's kind of a reference to what I told, talked before, kind of how Beam refers to other systems. So Beam should get access to schemas uh, uh, quite, quite soon, and it will enable simplification and various cool optimizations. And then, Kind of, when I look at the future, where the things stand, I usually see a pyramid of use cases in streaming. When, when most people start with streaming, they focus on the bottom of this pyramid in the ETL type of workloads, right? Something's going on, I have a stream of events and I'm loading it into a database. Right, that's a common ETL use case and many projects are good at it. The current state of the art tends to be in streaming analytics. Uh, Right? This is where 
uh, Beam SQL, for example, comes in, and where you are really converting a stream into a table, right? So this is an aggregation of a stream into a real-time table, and that's the use case we call streaming analytics. That's the state of the art, and it's a lot of in, uh, improvement is happening there. But kind of the m even better use case of streaming is only yet to come up, and that is when there is no human in the loop, when you can take actions from a streaming system in real time, when you can find patterns and take actions without human in the loop. Right? That's even better than analytics, where you are really producing a dashboard, and if you are producing a dashboard, a human is look at, looking at it, and then if, it's, if, if it's for the sake of the human, human will look at it once in the morning, once in the evening, you really have a batch system twice a day type of. So really streaming will shine in real-time actions, and that is only coming up, and I would expect adoption of these kinds of use cases to happen over the next few years. So to address these kinds of things, Beam SQL is there, and you'll hear much more uh, about Beam SQL in the next talk. Here, just a quick slide, you can apply a streaming, uh, streaming um, query on a P collection, you get another P collection out, and you can mix and match streaming, uh, sorry, um, Beam SQL with other types of transformations to build a fully fledged pipeline. There are people interested in the concept of complex event processing. So our, our, our friends from France and, uh, and a couple of uh, new contributors are looking in building a complex event processing library extension inside Beam. This would be kind of a DSL, another new DSL on top of Beam, where you can express uh, typically temporal joins over streams. I'm also quite interested in this space. I find it quite cool. If any of you have use cases in this space, I'd love to talk to you. And then other work in progress in the, that's happening on in the project is things like uh, performance testing improvements, build system improvements, and other things that make contribution easier. We really revamped the con uh, contribution material recently, so if any of you are interested in, in contributing to the project, uh, it, you would find uh, probably a quite nice getting started experience and lots of starter tasks to, uh, to get familiar with the project and get involved with the community. To really come back to the beginning and sum up the talk, right, if you remember one thing out of this talk is the sentence, right, unified programming model designed to provide efficient and portable data processing pipelines. Unified, efficient, and portable. And I encourage everyone to, to, to come and join the next session on, on streaming SQL and how Beam Project is thinking and approaching it in a quite, quite new and unique way. Thank you very much. All right, um, so data governance is a great problem that we are facing and the whole industry is facing. Uh, Apache Atlas is the only open source solution that exists in the market today. However, I can tell you that I know of four vendors very actively investing in the space. So this is quite new, and, uh, new space and there will be lots of announcements from multiple vendors coming up later this year and particularly in the, in the fall, fall uh, conference season. Uh, Beam right now does not have integration with any data governance platform. Beam's kind of approach to this is really, it's the job of the engine to do this. Kind of it's the job of the engine of the runner to connect to a particular uh, to a particular data provenance uh, database. So given that stance, and given how the, the ecosystem is moving, I would expect to see very shortly multiple solutions in addition to Apache Atlas, but all of them will kind of cover their preferred technologies. So uh, Hortonworks group of technologies will work on, on one data lineage system, uh, Google's will work on another, and so on and so on. Uh, I would expect it will take another 
few years before any of that is standardized and integrated with each other. So you should expect kind of um, ability to differentiate in this specific space by the vendors. Yes? So uh, Yeah, so basically, this is like same thing as, as have been done in computer science before, right? Uh, the, uh, in Beam, we have a set of uh, a few uh, uh, primitives, like parallel do, group by key, and, and, and things like that. If you implement five, six, seven primitives, you can run any pipeline, right? And then you have kind of understanding of more composite things that you can uh, replace composites with your specific additional optimizations that you have in addition to primitives that we require you to implement. So implementing primitives, you run anything, and then uh, you can choose to replace some composites with optimizations that you have in your engine. Like say, yeah, some other stuff. So I will, uh, so, so in terms of customer use cases, Beam is adopted a lot by Google Cloud customers and it has been the, the technology of choice for Google Cloud in particular because of the quality of the Google Cloud data flow service. Outside Google Cloud, Beam has not been uh, adopted too much particularly because of lack of solutions and lack of vendors in, uh, that would run it on other clouds or on premise. So that's kind of the state of adoption. Uh, so use cases where Beam has been really successful is kind of quite broad, not particularly different than Spark or Flink. Like people have been using it for the same set of use cases. Uh, whether there has been shift from one engine to the other or from one API to the other, it, it tends not to be driven by, um, by, by kind of strengths and weaknesses, right? You know, if you want to switch to Google Cloud, then Beam is a great choice for you, right? That's kind of those strategic shifts tend to uh, define what you pick much more than, than strengths and weaknesses there. Yeah, I understand the question. Yes. Have you seen that happen? So, outside data flow, for sure not, because using Spark API on Spark versus Beam API on Spark would not be meaningfully different given the functionality, for example, in the Spark Runner. So that, that would, could only happen on Google Cloud data flow, uh, but I don't know of a very specific case where that was true. Okay, uh, I have given talk here two years ago with very specific graphs about how Beam API enables uh, efficient execution. For example, thing called um, dynamic uh, work rebalancing, and kind of when you can when you have a straggler, so that you can steal work and move it to another worker and things like that. Right? This is the concept in Beam, where once the worker pool is not fixed, and there is as an engine you delegate work to many workers, then an engine is kind of following how much progress is being made there, and then rebalancing things dynamically to achieve perfect utilization of the cluster. 
So for example, I, I showed, uh, so I, I would recommend watching that video from two years ago, and you'll see kind of 25% improvement just by enabling dynamic work rebalancing on an engine uh, by taking advantage of the idle time that workers are not doing anything but waiting for other workers to finish work because their next work is dependent on the output of, of the previous task. There is lots of kind of inefficiencies unless you can dynamically rebalance work among the cluster of machines. Mm -hmm. For example, yep. So when you look at the pipeline, the pipeline can be I/O bound or CPU bound. This absolutely applies to being uh, CPU bound. If you are I/O bound, unfortunately, not much can be done unless you can change the source to be much more elastic, right? So, for example, cloud is much more elastic than reading from HDFS. Comp you know, S3, GCS, and services like that will not probably give you an I.O. bound experience. Is there, is there, a, is there a, an option to take self-tune after the CDI? Is, is there somewhere in the system? So the, that depends on the runner. In Google Cloud Dataflow, the mantra is no knobs. So you cannot tune anything, you know, with some exceptions. In most other systems, you have to, because that's how they are designed. Uh, we are out of time, so I would like let's just move there, and then I'll answer the question. That, that one and, and any other, feel free to feel free to come by.